Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com. Today we're going to be starting a new series. My most requested video as of late is to do some deep analysis of Kaspara versus Deep Blue. So if you're not too familiar with Deep Blue, this is a supercomputer created back in the 1990s by IBM. Up until this point, there was never a computer that actually beat a reigning world champion in competition. Uh, computers at this point were not uh, that great at chess. Uh, they could, you know, do long calculations, but as far as a timed game, they were not that great. So IBM came out there and said, you know, we've created this supercomputer called Deep Blue and we want to challenge Kasparov. Now, uh, they did play twice in 1996. They played the first time. Kasparov did win that uh, 4-2, to two, by a score of 4-2. to two. And in 1997, they had a rematch, um, and Deep Blue actually won that, 3.5 points to 2.5 points. Now, um, there was a lot of controversy. Kasparov uh, basically said that IBM cheated, um, especially in, in one particular match that we'll be going over in this series. Um, he requested a rematch for a third, kind of a rubber match, kind of a winner-takes-all best two out of three. Uh, IBM decided to decline that um, and therefore we kind of have this you know Kasparov won 1996 and you know IBM Deep Blue won 1997 with some controversy in there but uh, a lot of fantastic games I like to do a lot of analysis of famous games um, I thought what, a, what better way to do um, you know so many people have requested but I think it's so fantastic to watch a reigning world champion in his prime um, Gary Kasparov one of the greatest chess players of all time playing against the supercomputer so you know obviously computers they don't get fatigued uh, you can't really trick them um, you know they definitely play one style uh, which you know humans kind of you know changed up every now and then um, but again there, there's not really many mistakes that a computer does so you have to play tactically sound you have to play great chess um, and, and that's what I think we're going to be seeing through all of these games. So um, I'm actually going to be going over four different games from the 96 series and three different games from the 97 series, all of which were um, someone won. So if you're like, oh, you know, why don't you show games where they tied? Well, there's some phenomenal games where, you know, both sides tied, but I just don't want to do a series of like, you know, 15 games, but I am going to do um, all seven of the games that actually ended in someone winning. So just if you're thinking about some of the videos that are coming up in the future, still going to be doing some openings, um, but definitely going to be focusing a lot on this series right now. So hopefully you guys enjoy this. Without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into the game. In this game, this is 1996. This is game number one. The white pieces are being played by Deep Blue, the supercomputer from IBM, and the black pieces are going to be played by Kasparov, the reigning world champion at this given time. So white starts with pawn to e4, very, very common. Uh, Garrix is... Gary Kasparov is going to start with pawn to c5. This is the Sicilian defense, and white plays pawn to c3. Now, kind of studying over this game, I thought this was interesting. A lot of times at top level play, you'll see, you know, after pawn to e4 in the Sicilian defense, you might see, you know, knight to f3 if you want to. Um, so, pawn to c3, I was actually kind of uh, surprised, um, but definitely interested to see how this game would evolve. Um, with this pawn to c3 just because you don't see it that much at top level play. Gary Kasparov plays pawn 2d5 again trying to control the center of the board trying to counter uh, this pawn here on e4. Black's really going to have a dominant control of this d5 square early on into the game. You'll see that's kind of a focus point uh, that Gary Kasparov kind of focuses on um, you know even moving into the middle of the game. So White's going to take on d5 and Kasparov is going to come down and take here on d5. Now typically anytime you see the queen come involved early into the game you can usually get your your knights involved into the game and actually kick that queen back with tempo but as you can see in this example the pawn here on c3 is actually blocking the knight to come to c3. So uh, right now White cannot kick this queen off with tempo so he's going to continue with his development and just play pawn to d4, again pushing his pawns forward, trying to control the center of the board, and Gary Kasparov is going to do the same thing. Black plays knight to f6, again focusing on simple development moves from his minor pieces, but also again trying to hone down on this d5 square. He's really going to focus on that early on into the game. White plays knight to f3, again he can't get his queen's knight involved into the game, so go ahead and get your other knight involved into the game. And Kasparov is going to go ahead and bring his bishop down to g4. Now it's very important early on if you watch any of my videos, you know that it's a, usually a lot easier to get uh, your king bishop involved into the game. So uh, the light square bishop for white 
and also the dark square bishop for black here. So, uh, you know, many times it's harder to get the queen bishop involved into the game. So anytime you can get this out um, and pin down one of your opponent's knights, typically that is not a bad thing at all. So it kind of restricts the play for uh, white here. Um, as far as, you know, he really can't get this knight involved into the game yet. Um, he's really going to need to use this bishop to defend this. Um, and he does get this light square bishop involved into the game. He doesn't kind of have to worry about that later on, you know. Uh, he is at some point going to want to play, you know, pawn to e6, kind of as we talked about before, um, you know, opening up this dark square so he can kind of defend this pawn here on c5. Also kind of get involved into the action of the board if he wants to focus in on trying to attack this pawn on f2. Always a huge weakness for white early on. So definitely you want to get these bishop out of um, you know this back row before you start to um, you know solidify your pawn structure and kind of lock that bishop in. So that's kind of why we see this bishop come out early. And white's going to play bishop 2e2. Again, as we talked about, uh, making sure that this pin is no longer there to the queen. Uh, so white can kind of freely do what he wants to from here on out. Black is now going to play pawn to e6. Again, now that we have the bishop outside of the pawn chain, uh, Garry Kasparov can now play pawn to e6, getting ready to get his dark square bishop involved into the game. Now, white's going to play pawn to h3. You never really want to have um, you know, a bishop here kind of pinning down one of your pieces. You really want to kind of alleviate some of that pressure. So uh, pawn to h3, very logical move, trying to kick that back. Typically, at top-level play, even though a knight and a bishop are around the same uh, point value. Uh, typically, you won't see someone trade that off early on as far as giving up a bishop for a knight. Um, it's much easier to open up a game um, as far as removing some of the pawn structures in the middle. And bishops do really, really well in open games. Um, it's much harder to close the game up as far as the pawn structure. You can't really move around the middle of the board. Um, and knights do fairly well in in those closed games. So uh, that's kind of why, if you're always wondering, like, why don't people actually like to trade off bishops early on? Uh, that's kind of why. Later on, once you see the pawn structures kind of get fixed, as far as you kind of know what's going to happen, uh, then actually, you know, a lot of people will prefer, you know, maybe knights over bishops. But early on, uh, you typically rarely see that from a high-level chess player, especially, um, you know, Garry Kasparov, the reigning world champion. So uh, black's going to go ahead and kick that back to h5, and white's going to castle on the king side. Obviously, you know, once you start to develop your minor pieces, then you definitely want to get your um, your king to safety. If it's castling on the queen side or if it's castling on the king side, excuse me, queen or king side, uh, you definitely want to get him to safety. Now, you're typically going to be castling on the side that you are developing your minor pieces. So um, if you look at this case, you know, white has developed his knight to f3. He's also developed his bishop to e2. So obviously more than likely he's going to castle on the king side. Uh, black's going to continue his development, knight to c6. Uh, again, uh, putting a lot of pressure on this uh, square here on d4. Again, he's pretty much dominating this square here on d5. He uh, does have this pawn and this knight here on f6, both kind of eyeing down at and he already has a major piece right there on d5 with his queen. So uh, already has this and again starting to you know get the rest of his pieces involved into the game. Right now it's about equal in um, you know if you're kind of looking if you run this through a search an engine for for chess um, whether it's Fritz or Ripker or, you know whatever you're running um, as far as the position it's about equal right now we'll kind of get into you know later on as far as when that starts to change uh, but right now it, it's it's pretty close to equal. Uh, White now is going to bring his bishop to e3. Again, early on, both sides are just trying to you know, get their king to safety and develop their pieces um, in a logical manner right now. So uh, black is going to take here on d4, and white's going to take with his pawn on d5. And then we see the bishop immediately come down to b4. Now, it's very important to note, um, any time a piece or a pawn moves from your opponent, always look at the space left behind. You may have heard this from a lot of other um, you know, great chess minds is always thinking about the the space left behind. Once this pawn moves um, from c3 to d4, it kind of opens up this space here on d4. Um, and Garry Kasparov immediately he needs to get his dark square bishop involved into the game so he can castle on the king side. So he goes ahead and brings down his bishop to b4. Obviously, it, it's kind of a passive move to bring it to d6. Uh, there's no really need to bring it to, to e7. His knight's not being pinned down to anything. Um, obviously, c5 would be a huge blunder. Um, a3, 
you might as well just turn off the video right now. Uh, so B4, very logical move, and also, you know, it kind of restricts some of the play. Um, you know, a lot of times you might see White bring his, uh, you know, Rook to E1, kind of restricting that. So definitely a good move from Kasparov. White decides now to kind of kick this back, so he plays pawn to a3, very similar to what he did over here with pawn to h3. The bishop's going to come back to a5, and now White's going to play knight to c3. Again, developing his minor pieces, getting him involved into the game. He knows, well, we say he, it's a computer, um, but you know, again, uh, Gary Kasparov is not going to give up his bishop early on into the game to exchange this. Um, so he kind of now, as we talked about before, he wasn't able to, but the computer was not able to develop his minor piece, this knight here, um, and kick this queen back with tempo. But he is now. So that's kind of why he is taking this opportunity now. Um, and the queen's going to come back to d6, and now white's going to play knight to b5. Again, continuing this assault, putting a lot of pressure on Garry Kasparov, um, and now Garry Kasparov needs to continue to move his queen because he's being attacked. So he brings it back to e7, and now the computer plays knight to e5. And this is kind of where I want to stop and kind of talk about uh, both of the positions, as both positions kind of now we, got, we go into the middle game. So we're going to go ahead and go over a few more moves. You can see there is a discovered attack on this bishop here on h5. Go, so Gary Kasparov is going to go ahead and just exchange these bishops here on e2. Um, his bishop here on h5 was not doing a whole heck of a lot. Um, and since this knight here on e5 is no longer being pinned, uh, might as well just go ahead and exchange this since the light square bishop for white again early on um, is a little bit stronger than the light square bishop for black. So uh, might as well just come in and exchange those. So uh, white's going to go ahead and take that and then black's going to castle on the king side. So this is where I want to kind of talk about the transition. Everyone, um, you know, there's three main parts of a chess game. You do have the, the opening, kind of the beginning. Beginning. Then you kind of have the middle game, which is where we're kind of about to to get into, and then you have the end game, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but the middle game is kind of reached when both sides have developed um, pretty much all their pieces. You know, you obviously develop your minor pieces towards the middle of the board. Uh, minor pieces typically are supporting your pawns, um, are supporting other minor pieces, trying to control the center. You definitely want to have, you know, king safety, whether that's on the king side or the queen side. You always want to connect your rooks. Rooks are always working better if they are connected, whether they are on, um, you know, the first rank or if they're on a specific file like the C file, if they're both on the C file, they definitely work well if they're connected in that sense. Uh, but from here, both sides are developed. They've done everything. They have king safety. So what do they do now? And that's kind of where we get into um, just the heart of chess. And, and this is where I really enjoy studying the game um, because you really now have to have some sort of strategy. You have to you know, really dig deep and start to find different tactics and have all your pieces start to, to work together. Uh, your major pieces start to defend and um, help out your minor pieces as they begin to actually attack and not just support their pawns. Um, so a lot starts to go into it. So if we kind of look at it, if we look at this position right here, white is a little bit more active. Obviously he does have um, you know, his knights here on the fifth rank. Um, black is a little bit back. Uh, he's only on the third rank if we're kind of looking at it from his angle. Um, white does have this pawn here on f4, controlling the center of the board a little bit more here on than this pawn here on e6. But do keep in mind that this pawn here on d4 is is an isolated pawn, meaning that there are no pawns on either side of it. So this can be a huge weakness. It can also be a huge strength. It's going to be a little bit easier for this to become a pass pawn, uh, getting past this pawn here on e6, and then it can freely come over here to d8 and promote to any piece that White wants it. But right now, it's actually going to be a huge weakness that Garrick Kasparov is actually going to hone in on um, and try to exploit this pawn here on d4. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, white does have a little bit of an advantage as far as, you know, his tempo, his, um, you know, middle of the board is a, a little bit more advanced at that, but Gary Kasparov definitely has ways that he can attack and kind of chip away at this position right here that white has. 
Now we've kind of talked about how rooks work together. You also want to have rooks on open files. So uh, immediately in this game, you're going to see white bring his rook to c1. Um, you know, obviously he can do a lot more damage this rook can if he's on a open file than if he's kind of behind this pawn here on a three. He can't really do a lot. Um, so and this kind of goes for any of your pieces, which are why bishops are good in open games. The more space they can move to, the the more squares they can actually get to um, in a fast period of time, the better they are. So knights actually work better in the middle of the board um, because they can you know get to all different places of the board. If they're on the edge, if they're on the rim, a lot of times you'll hear the knight on the rim is dim. Uh, the knight can't go that many places. So anytime you're looking at a piece and you're like, where would this be good on the board? Uh, look at the board and see where you can go that gives it the most opportunity to, to move. Now, in the case of a rook, it's always going to be on open file. So this rook automatically comes to c1, and Garrett Kasparov immediately brings his rook to c8. This is an open file and c file, so they both kind of flock to that. Now, the bishop is going to come to g5, logical moves we talked about before. Anytime you can pin down a knight to uh, your opponent's queen here, obviously this knight is also protecting this d5 square. Always an important square, the center of the board. Um, it's a good thing. Now, he doesn't have to worry too much about this knight here on e5. He does have a pawn and a queen protecting it, but but um, he does need to notice, the, com the computer being a he, um, is that this pawn is no longer being protected by this bishop. So Garry Kasparov right away is going to start to um, attack this. Again, it is an isolated pawn. Right now, it is a weakness for white. So Garry Kasparov sees this, and he's going to start to attack that. He brings his bishop to b6. Logical move. There's not a whole lot of different things that... Kasparov can do right now. Um, so black moves, bishop to b6, attacking this pawn. Um, and white's going to play, you know, hey, bishop takes on f6. Now, Gary Kasparov is actually going to take with his pawn here. Now, if you look at it and you say, you know, why doesn't he take with his queen? Um, if he takes with his, you know, his pawn, he does have this g file open. Uh, and that's true, but keep in mind, if he does take with his queen, it's actually going to be a pretty tough game for him when white plays knight to d6. It's kind of getting too close for comfort here. Um, and this queen's kind of at a position here. Uh, you know, the queen side is being attacked, you know, heavily from white here. Um, and it's just not quite as, you know, as good as if he just takes with, with g6. And again, he can always... Um, you know, bring his king over to h8 if he needs to for safety. Um, he can also, when he brings his king over to h8, he can also get a rook involved into the game if he wants to put a lot of pressure on this king side from white. So um, if you look at that and you're like, you know, why does he do that? Um, it's actually not that bad of a move. Again, it, it is also forcing this knight to move. So uh, the knight's being attacked. He needs to come back to, to c4. Um, and then black's going to play rook to d8. Again, uh, this is a semi-open file, so you definitely want your rooks on semi-open files or open files. And it's also putting more and more pressure on this pawn on d4. So always don't just move to move your pieces. Take a look at Gary Kasparov, uh, deep blue supercomputer. Um, move for a reason. So right now, Gary Kasparov has one mission, and that is to attack this pawn on d4. And that's a good mission. Um, you know, white is trying to basically create small little weaknesses across the board. And you kind of see that from, um, you know, his exchange here on f6 and also this next move. So he plays knight to b6 and black's going to retake with his pawn here on b6. So, um, you know, as we kind of talked about moving into the middle game, it, there's always this small things that kind of add up into a game that at the end um, kind of become much bigger things. So as you can see, white has exploited and now black has two double pawns. So he has a double pawn here on the F file and he also has a double pawn here on the B file. So uh, definitely a huge weakness for Garry Kasparov. Obviously nothing that um, you know he can't play back from. Um, and you know white still has this huge weakness here with a isolated pawn on the D file. White is now going to bring his other rook involved into the game. Obviously, he wants to protect this pawn here on d4. And Garrick Sparov is going to play pawn to f5. Now, this is really just getting ready for his queen to come to f6 to add more pressure onto the pawn on d4. 
Um, he also kind of wants to, to solidify this pawn chain. Uh, this pawn here on f6 is only being defended by the queen. Uh, but when it does come to f5, it does have that extra support from the pawn here on e6. So kind of, um, you know, a versatile move as far as what he can do with that. But that that's kind of why he did it. So from here, um, excuse me, why is going to play queen to e3. Um, again, getting ready if he wants to, he can now not only protect this pawn here on d4, but he can also get involved into the game. He can come to g5 if he wanted to. Obviously, that would be moronic right now because of the queen there on e7. He can also come to g3, check the king. Uh, so this definitely gives him a lot of flexibility, um, and that's kind of why you move queen to e3. Now, uh, black is now going to play queen to f6, as we talked about. Again, putting a lot of pressure on this pawn on d4. Um, white now senses that there's too much pressure on this pawn just here on d4. He actually decides to push forward with his pawn. Now, uh, Garrick Sparov now decides to exchange rooks off. So rook exchange, rook exchange, and Garrick Sparov takes back with his pawn on d4. Now, if you kind of look at this exchange, uh, you kind of see these small little things adding up and adding up. And even if you run it through a chess engine, again, I um, always like to look at different positions in the game and just see how, um, you know, supercomputers now, which are obviously a, a lot stronger than, um, you know, even Deep Blue was, but um, just to kind of see, and there's these small little increments that kind of go on, these, these small different moves uh, throughout the game, and at the end of the game, you know, they, they definitely add up. So as you can see here, Garry Kasparov has doubled pawns on the F file, he has doubled pawns on the B file, and he now has an isolated pawn on the D file. So uh, definitely starting to, you know, get more and more weaknesses for black, where white, he got, he kind of got rid of his one weakness, which was that isolated pawn on the D file, and he kind of exchanged that for an isolated pawn, um, you know, for black here. So uh, just keep that in mind, he, white is down in material right now. Uh, but he, you know, he's going to get that back pretty soon. He can always take with uh, his queen here on b6. Uh, first, though, he is going to play pawn to b3. Um, you know, his pawn was being, you know, attacked by the queen here on f6. Um, so he knows there's no way really to protect this pawn on b3 safely. Um, obviously, he could move his knight, but it's not going to be safe because the rook could always come here to. Um, c8 if you wanted to. So just keep that in mind. From here, black's going to play king to h8. Definitely just the threat sometimes, e even if a player doesn't move, just the threat of the queen coming to, let's say, g3, um, you know, attacking this long diagonal. Or once the queen moves from f6, even just coming to g5, the threat of that um, sometimes can, you know, be very, very, um, you know, intense. So um, here, black decides to bring his king over to h8. Now, white can now come safely to b6 and take this pawn here on b6. Garrick Kasparov is now going to start to push forward. He's going to play uh, rook to g8, starting to put a lot of pressure on the king side from white. Now, if Garrick Kasparov was playing a mediocre player that falls for traps, uh, white might actually play queen takes on b7. Again, it is free material. Uh, why not take it? You you know you're already up as far as you know pawn structure. Why not be up an extra pawn in material? Uh, well, this would actually be a huge blunder. Uh, Garrick Kasparov could now come to g5, threatening checkmate here on g2. Uh, if White plays, you know pawn to g2, Garrick Kasparov can now come down and take this rook here on c1. Unfortunately for Garrick Kasparov, he's playing a supercomputer, and supercomputers do not fall for mind tricks. Um, at least in game one, they don't fall for mind tricks. So uh, from here, white's going to play queen to c5. Again, still putting a lot of pressure on black. So uh, attacking this pawn here on d5. Again, critical square we've talked about all game long. Um, but also defending the rook here on c1. Very, very important uh, that this rook is supported. Now, Garry Kasparov plays a huge mistake, and he plays pawn to d4. Now, if we look at this... Um, before he starts to push forward, he actually needs to get, you know, kind of a defense. He's kind of brought his rook over to g8. That kind of failed. Um, you know, there's really not going to be a huge attack that he can do that's going to work. Because um, if now, it, with the queen here on c5, if he were to bring his queen to, um, you know, g5, really wouldn't matter now if the pawn came to g2, or excuse me, g3, because 
this is kind of a fail. He would, you know, just take the rook and then lose his queen here. So um, what he really needs to do in this situation is just bring his rook over to d8. Um, you know, he's still down as far as, you know, if you run this through analysis. But uh, he definitely is still going to have a much better game here. Um, you definitely want your rooks, if they're not on open files, you want them supporting um, past pawns. and You want to push those pawns, um, you know, as fast and aggressive as you can. But um, instead, he kind of pushes it with no support. Uh, so he plays pawn to d4, and now white's going to play knight to d6. Kind of getting in the grill of Garry Kasparov. It's going to be really hard to handle uh, this knight here on d6. It's attacking so many different squares. Um, you know, again, it's just going to be really hard. So Garry Kasparov now plays pawn to f4. Another move he could have played instead of uh, rook over to d8. Could have played f4 first. Um, now White's going to play pawn. Or excuse me, Knight takes on b7. Again, Black's now losing material. It's not looking um, quite that great. Um, and now Garry Kasparov plays Knight to e5, and White's going to continue with. Queen over to d5. Again, still putting a lot of pressure. Uh, now pressuring on this f7 square as well. Um, and Garry Kasparov now is going to play pawn to f3. He's kind of trying. Um, you know, obviously he can't take with his pawn here um, on f3. Obviously, again, if, you know, white fell for traps, he could always take on, you know, d4, gaining material. But this would be a huge blunder uh, just with a rook coming down here to g2. Uh, White's actually in a huge um, you know, hole right here, but um, it is a supercomputer. Again, they don't make mistakes. So White, all he has to do is just play pawn to g3, and then Garry Kasparov plays knight to d3, and the rook's going to come over here to c7. He is being attacked, so he does need to move this rook, and White comes to c7. Anytime you can get your rook to the 7th rank, if you're White, or the 2nd rank for Black, that's exactly where you want it to be. Um, obviously, you're going to be able to attack um, all of the pawns that have not moved yet. And also, if the king has not moved it, it pretty much restricts all of his movement um, on on the board. Now, if there's no pawns on the 7th rank and the, and the king is outside of the 8th rank, it's not quite as good. Um, but still, definitely, if, if you're kind of looking to move your rook forward, kind of looking for a place for him to go, the 7th rank is usually a very, very good place for him to go. So, um, from here, Garry Kasparov probably makes um, another blunder that kind of cost him the game. Um, from here, you know, he probably could have come to, let's say, queen to e5. This is probably his best bet. Try to exchange off these queens here and then just try for, um, you know, a tie. Uh, he's definitely down in material right now, but um, if he played smart, he probably could have gotten a tie, in my opinion. Um, instead, he brings his rook over to e8, um, and this is kind of kind of the end right here. So the knight now comes to d6, attacking this rook here on e8. Garry Kasparov was just kind of going for the win. He uh, he brings his rook now down to e1. Unfortunately, there's just not enough pieces um, to get into this attack, and the king is going to be very very safe. He's just going to come over to h2. Uh, the knight's going to come into f2. Garry Kasparov kind of sees that um, his really only opportunity is to attack later on if he wants to bring his rook over to h1. Um, you know, he can do that. But, again, his time is too limited right now. Uh, the knight's now going to come to f7 check, so the king has to move here. The king's going to come down to g7, kind of continue to go through the moves. Knight comes down to g5 check, discovered attack. The rook is now attacking check. Uh, the king is going to come back to h6, and now the rook comes over to h7. And this is actually where Garry Kasparov uh, resigned in the game. So, um, you know, good game. The first game goes to White, the supercomputer. Um, this is actually the first time a supercomputer beat a reigning world champion. So, uh, definitely, definitely a huge event. Now, um, you know, fear not, 1996, Garry Kasparov actually did win the series. So, um, spoiler alert if you're getting ready for the, the future videos. Uh, Garry Kasparov definitely comes back with a vengeance and just dominates. Um, but in this particular game, I don't know if he was caught off guard um, or just didn't sleep enough the night before. Uh, but, you know, White definitely played a very, very sharp game. Um, definitely found small little... 
uh, mistakes from Garrett Kasparov that he could kind of um, you know, go after an attack, and at the end of it, um, Garrick Sparv is in a bad position as King is being attacked. Um, now, just to go ahead and play it out, because everyone's like, oh, you know, I don't, he's not in checkmate, so why would he give up? Um, it's definitely going to be hard for him to continue. Obviously, um, you know, he can bring his king to g6 if he wants to. Uh, now the queen can come to g8, check, not a whole lot of moves that can come from here. The king can come back to f5. Um, you know, now the knight can take on f3, and this kind of stops. You know, Rook was Black was really looking to bring his Rook over to H1 for checkmate, but without this pawn here on F3, um, it's not going to do a whole heck of a lot. So even if the Rook comes over to H1 um, after the King comes to G2, there's not a whole lot that Black can do here. Obviously, he can bring his King over here, uh, trying to eye down. You know, his Queen coming to F3 for checkmate, but. Um, you know, white can always just bring his rook down to h4. Pretty much anything black were to try, white has an answer. His king's in the middle of the board. Never a good sign when your opponent has, you know, a queen and a rook involved into the game. Um, so Gary Kasparov just went ahead and, you know, resigned in this situation. So um, definitely learned a lot studying this game. Hopefully you guys enjoyed a lot. Not only watching Gary Kasparov, one of the great players, um, watching a tactical supercomputer play chess, um, but also just watching um, you know a chess game deeply analyzed. Um, if you guys enjoyed it, let me know in the comments. Um, again, we're going to be doing a series, so there's going to be about seven videos about this. So um, definitely, hopefully, you guys can watch this and enjoy it. Um, and I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.